this is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one with some popcorn bucks, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Rosha Shive here with another episode, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you the latest on what is happening on the street and respecting our world here in the metaverse. This episode is um, episode 12, Crypto War and Cryptography, titled War Does Not Determine Who Is Right, Only Who Is Left. So before we get on to the theme about the crypto war and cryptography, um, of this episode, uh, we're going to do a little bit about the news. So I have a link in the show notes. Uh, this is a very interesting article. It's called Technology Intimates Art, The Rise of Conversational Interface, written by Paul uh, Capiola, designed by Iker Fernandez and Servanca and Albanini, and developed by Jesper Bernardo. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read this article, but basically what it is, is this um, journalist wrote this article, and these guys who designed it have incorporated a, a chat bot in, there, in here that can guide you through the article, and you can type and ask it questions, and so it's very interactive. It's a 17-minute read, but it's just a very unique experience, and it just shows the level of you know AI and chat bots and how they can be incorporated in different ways of interaction out there in the world, just beyond just messaging. I can see this application, um, when you go through it, being used, for example, for academic articles, where maybe you can chatbot with uh, the personality of the author of an academic article, or a knowledge base where you try to ask questions, maybe you didn't understand maybe a particular syntax, or uh, a better breakdown of a particular formula or a word verbiage or something like that and go back and forth and kind of engage and kind of get a clarity of, of a subject matter, if you will. This next article is very interesting and unique. Um, it's from the National Post uh, and the Associated Press is by Egil Barson. The heaters don't even understand it. I say it. Icelandic people worry that their language is facing extinction. Reykjavik, Iceland. When an Icelander arrives at an office building and sees Sothir posted, they need no further explanation for the empty premise. The word means when staff gets an unexpected afternoon off to enjoy good weather. The people of this rugged North Atlantic island settled by Norsemen some 1100 years ago have a unique dialect of Old Norse has adapted to life at the edge of the Arctic. Hasluff, for example, means heavy snowfall with large flakes occurring in calm wind. But the revived Icelandic language, seen by many as a source of identity and pride, is being undermined by the wider, widespread use of English, both for mass tourism and in the voice-controlled artificial intelligent devices coming into vogue. Linguistic experts studying the future of language spoken by fewer than 400,000 people in an increasingly globalized world wonder if this is the beginning of the end of the Icelandic tongue. Former President Vajis Himota told the Associated Press that Iceland must take steps to protect its language. She's particularly concerned that programs be, de- be developed so that the language can be easily used in digital technology. Otherwise, Icelandic will end in the Latin thing she wants. Teachers are already sensing a change among students in the scope of the Icelandic vocabulary and reading comprehension. Anya Jostinja, a teaching consultant, says she often hears seniors speak English among themselves when she visits schools in Reykjavik, the capital. She says that fictional students are no longer sending a volume from the sagas of Icelanders. The medieval literature chronicling the early settlers of Iceland. Icelanders have long prided themselves to being able to fluently read the epic tales originally penned on calfskin. Most high schools are, are, are also waiting until senior re- year to read Haldor's Laskus, the 1955 winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, who rests in a small cemetery near his farm in West Iceland. A number of factors combined to make the future of Icelandic language uncertain. Tourism has exploded in recent years, becoming the country's single biggest employer. An analyst at Aaron Bank say 
one in two new jobs is being filled by foreign labor. The increasing use of English as a universal communicator and diminishing the role of Icelandic experts say. The less useful Icelandic becomes in people's daily life, the closer we are as a nation to get to the threshold of giving it use, says Erika Robundish, a language professor at the University of Iceland. He's embarked on a three year study of 5,000 people that will be the largest inquiry ever into the use of the language. Preliminary studies suggest that children at their, as, at their first language acquisition are increasingly not exposed to enough Icelandic to foster a strong basis for later years, he said. Concerns for the Icelandic language are by no means new. In the 19th century, when its vocabulary and syntax were heavily influenced by Danish, independence movements fought to revive the Icelandic as a common tongue central to the calm that the Icelanders were a nation. Since Iceland became fully independent from Denmark in 1944, its pre- presidents have long championed the need to protect the language. As Jir Johnson, an economic professor at the University of Iceland, said, without a unique language, Iceland could experience a brain drain, particularly among certain professions. A British town with a population size of Iceland has far fewer scientists and artists, for example, they simply moved to the metropolitan. Problems compounded because many new computer design- devices are designed to recognize English, but they do not understand Icelandic. Not being able to speak Icelandic to voice active fridges, interactive robots, and similar devices could yet another be yet another lost field, Johnson said. Icelandic ranks among the weakest and least supported languages in terms of digital technology, along with Irish Gaelic, Latvia, Maltese, and Lithuania, according to a report by the Multilingual Europe Technology Alliance assessing 30 European languages. The Iceland Ministry of Education estimates about 1 billion Icelandic chronic or 8.0 million is needed to proceed funding for an open access database to help tech developers adapt Icelandic as a language option. Savis Savoja, a member of Iceland's parliament for the left green movement, said the government should not be weighing costs for the nation's cultural heritage at stake. If we wait, we may already be too late, she said. Uh, so this is, you know, it's about the transitioning from our digital world to what's currently now. And this is not the only thing that's being um, discussed or bantered around, if you will. You know, there's the the, thing, the concept of, you know, books and artwork and, and movies and TV shows, things being lost because they're not being digitized. Um, there's also the concern, you know, just by language and cultural heritage, you know, because we put things to digital, are they going to last because they're not in the physical form that people have utilized for centuries and being preserved proper, properly? In languages, you know, another, I guess you can say another thing that's being disrupted by technology. It'd be interesting to see if there is some headway this year, and I'll do an update if there is, uh, if they're successful in starting and initiating this program. They'll allow for um, Icelanders to speak in their native tongue. They- so this episode, we're going to, before we actually get into the heart of the matter, we have to kind of cover a little bit of history. Cryptography has been used um, pretty much since the beginning of time. There are certain things throughout history through various civilizations, regardless where they are placed in the world or at a time frame. There are certain things that, certain tropes, if you will, we borrow uh, like a literary term or a fictional term that are part of various civilizations. And, you know, farming techniques, um, God, particularly like, in particular, the fertile god. You always see fertile fertility gods and death gods um, in almost every um, type of civilization. Um, no matter what level they may, may be, they will have like a fertility fertility god and a, a death god. Uh, you see certain types of funeral rites. Um, and when you start getting the written language, you start seeing the formation of cryptography of writing hidden messages, if you will, using coded language to protect your information from being um, intercepted by the enemy or people you don't want to hear. Uh, Different forms of what is the written language itself or the actual carrying device, the seals, to know that this particular message came from this particular person or how it was sealed to make sure that not anyone can just open it up, you know, it's locked in a certain manner. So keeping things hidden, keeping things secret is has been part of just, you know, humans and the human condition in general. And what we're seeing here in the new flare-up of the crypto war is all these types of efforts, if you will, to uh, unlock the ability for individuals 
how even businesses to be able to encrypt their information and keep it hidden from the government. Now, the government tries to justify this by stating, you know, terrorism or criminality or something like that, but there really is no really substantial justification. Um, people have a right to, to write hidden messages. People have a right to keep their information private. Privacy is a basic human right, a tenant of all human beings to possess and have. And so, as of late, you're seeing a flare-up of what is known as the crypto wars. Obviously, it occurred fairly early on, you know, in the 70s is when it first started. And then kind of died down um, thanks to the efforts of the, the cypherpunks um, in the um, early to mid-90s. And now, we're here we are in the, you know, the beginning of the 21st century, really. Um, deep into the, you know, deep into it, if you will. 2017 here and it's it's flared up again um it kind of flared up in 2006 and kind of died down in eight and nine kind of goes in a simple manner as uh individuals and groups and private organizations and even other governments push back to efforts to uh prevent um the individual access to cryptography if you will um and a lot of this has to do with the you know the popularity and the advent of end-to-end encryptions on messaging services like whatsapp telegram signal things of that nature so let's kind of get into the history of it particularly um to talk it from the um you know the western concept of it um this is a global problem but um, we'll speak first about kind of the western end of things because you know that's you know i'm a westerner and i'm from the states and so a lot of my information and knowledge base is going to be from here so this is from california magazine published by um the California Alumni Association, U.S. Berkeley, by Sarah Elizabeth Adler. Encryption for all, why this American vision must be held, upheld. On August 28, 1789, Thomas Jefferson wrote to James Madison from Paris about the French revolutionaries, relaying an important piece of secret information. Murber, Murbai, or Murbu is their chief. Except what he really wrote was 58.510.49. 1341.1006.1354.581.738. Jefferson was writing the code, and not just about the French Revolution. The letter also contained changes to the language that would eventually become the First Amendment. When he visited the White House last summer, Jeffrey King brought copies of Jefferson's letter with him. King, a visiting lecturer at the UC Berkeley Media Studies Department in a French I mean, not French, but a First Amendment lawyer, was there to advocate against the government backdoors to encryption secret mechanisms that allow unauthorized access to encrypted information. While many proponents of the backdoors say that they are vital to intelligence gathering processes, privacy advocates like King believe that the very premise of the backdoor is faulty. If you put a backdoor in for law enforcement, you put it in for China, you put it in for Russia, King says. Meaning, if you engineer a backdoor for one purpose, you can't guarantee that it won't be exploited for another. King distributed copies of the letter to officials he met as a reminder of encryption's history in the United States. Jefferson and Madison, like many other contemporaries, often corresponded with help of ciphers. Jefferson even invented one himself, which were, which were used to encrypt sensitive information at the time of great political upheaval. They were hardly engaged in a novel practice. A form of encryption has been used around the world for at least 2,000 years. In the United States, the use of encryption constituted what King calls a long, beautiful tradition. The Bill of Rights itself owes to existence to a strong encryption, he said. Also, the First Amendment pro- protects the use of encryption, as does international law. The, recipi- the recipitory is striking. The very amendment that the Founding Fathers drafted with, with the help of encryption is now the same one that covers our rights to use it. That's because encryption is considered a form of protected speech under the First Amendment, the classification established by Bernstein versus U.S. Department of Justice. Daniel Bernstein was a Berkeley graduate student who sought to publish a source code for an encrypted algorithm he developed. At the time, the United States musician list classified encryption as a weapon, analogous to a bomb which could only be exported, or in Bernstein's case, published with State Department approval. After Bernstein's encryption export restrictions were eased, most importantly, the court ruled that software source code was entitled to First Amendment protection. Essentially, the conclusion the court came to was that you can think of encryption source code as another language or like music or mathematics, King says. You can't ban people from speaking Spanish or exporting things in Spanish, and you can't stop people from writing a sonic or a symphony and exporting them. Encryption source code is similar and protected. Many, including lawyers, activists, and journalists, routinely use encryption to protect themselves and their work. 
especially after the Snowden revolution emerged, which revealed that American cities are subject to unprecedented levels of domestic surveillance. Invasion of digital privacy can be can be corporate in origin, or in the case of data brokers that sell information about users to online adversary, advertisers, malevolent actors can pe- piggyback off this information. So digital rights under Trump. The outcome of the presidential election did little to quell concerns about the preservation of digital rights and civil liberties. Trump has advocated for an expansion of domestic surveillance, and King notes he has specifically he has specifically that he plans to expand the surveillance of American Muslims as well as other people who could be tracked. The massive surveillance apparatus at his disposal was expanded just a week before the inauguration, when the Obama administration enacted new rules that allowed the NSA to share raw streams of data with the FBI, DHS, and other agencies. Uh, Trump's appointees, who haven't exactly been proponents of digital, uh, digital privacy, are unlikely to act as institutional checks. Uh, Jeff Sessions, his attorney general pick, uh, who is now the attorney general, has back crypto back doors, and the new CIA director, Mike uh, Pompeo, Pompeo, sponsors legislation that would have reinstated the NSA's bulk collection of American telephone metadata. Trump's new FCC chair, uh, G. Pai, has opposed broadband privacy rules. Um, and he's also advocating, and the comment section is still going on for net neutrality. So I will, again, I have a link in the show notes if you want to uh, make a comment about uh, net neutrality, um, that it should be kept. Uh, these policies, along with restrictions on anonymity tools, have the potential to heavily restrict the number of civil and human rights. In 2015, a report, David K. Brooklyn Law Alumni and the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression wrote that encryption is inextricably intertwined to the rights of privacy, due process, and freedom of assembly. States, wrote K., should not restrict encryption and anonymity, which facilitate and often enable the rights to freedom of opinion and expression. According to K., measures taken to promote national cybersecurity, including anti-terrorism efforts, must take privacy concerns and the importance of freedom of expression into account. This, also, this was also the position taken by former State Department legal advisor Brian Egan, also a Berkeley Law graduate, and talk delivered at the Bolt Hall just after Election Day. Anti-terrorism efforts must not be conflated with broader call, calls to restrict public access to or access to the Internet, or even, as some have suggested, to effectively shut down the entire portion of the web, said Egan. Um, which happened to Cameroon when they were their access was cut, um, and stuff stuff like that is happening in Turkey where they have shut down different um, app programs within their uh, country to prevent uh, people from communicating with one another. Um, and then you have the big firewall in China. Like referencing Trump's 2015 remark that it was open to closing parts of the internet in an effort to thwart ISIS recruitment. Such measures would not advocate our security and then be inconsistent with our values. The internet must remain open to the free flow of information and idea. This King says is worrying given the history of surveillance programs like uh, Con- Contemporo, which pretty much shut down uh, the civil rights movement in this country as long as well as um, significantly hindered uh, Hispanic movements, a lot of different, you know, particularly people of color movements, but even the LGBT community. Um, it really, um, particularly towards the end of the 60s and into the 70s, it really hampered a lot of social movements that didn't really recover completely or at all. Um, in some cases, when they did regroup, it took them a very long time to able to galvanize together. Um, it actually took, you know, significant um, life-altering events for them to, to regather momentum, particularly with the LGBT community. It really took the um, the HIV outbreak and, and the, treat, the treatment of that community uh, because of uh, the, the AIDS scare, if you will, of the late seventies and all the way up into the early nineties that allow for the LGBT community to kind of reform again, if you will, and become a, um, an advocacy group. Uh, the history of the country is really incredibly abusive law enforcement and intelligent resources against the LGBT community, against people of color, against activists, against women, and against journalists, King, King says. And then the rest of the article talks about how to encrypt your digital life. So, the history of particularly states allows for the encryption. It was utilized by the founding fathers. It is protected by, or at least there's a court case that uh, states that it is a uh, freedom or right, or you know, it's your right to be able to encrypt your information. But this, of course, has not prevented or stopped uh, law enforcement or even um, various legislative act- actions and uh, bills either being put up or passed or even efforts by the government to try to curtail any kind of encryption efforts. So we're going to talk about right now about some of those early efforts, if you will, to curtail encryption efforts. 
So, the history of the first crypto wars. This is Paul Schneider on security. Um, as we're gearing up to fight the second crypto war over governance demands to be able to backdoor any cryptographic system, it pays to remember the history of the first crypto war. The Open Technology Institute has written the story of those years in the mid 90s. The act that truly launched the crypto wars was the White House introduction of the Clipper chip in 1993. Uh, the Clipper chip was a state-of-art microchip developed by the government engineers, which could be inserted into consumer hardware telephones, providing the public with strong cryptographic tools without sacrificing the ability of law enforcement and intelligent agencies to access unencrypted versions of those communications. The technology relied on a system of key escrows in which a copy of each chip's unique encryption key be stored by the government. Although the White House officials mobilized both political and technical allies in support of the proposal, they faced immediate backlash from technical esper- experts, privacy advocates, and industry leaders who were concerned about the security and economic impact of uh, the technology in addition to the obvious civil liberty, liber- liberty concerns. As the battle wore on through 1993 and 1994, leaders from across the political spectrum joined the fray, supported by a broad coalition that opposed the Clipper chip. When the computer scientist Matt Blaze discovered a flaw in the system in May 1994, it proved to be the final death blow, and the Clipper chip was dead. Nonetheless, the idea that the government should be find compatible, a way to access keys to encrypted communication lived on throughout, throughout the 1990s. Many policymakers held on hopes it were possible to, secure, to securely implement what they call software key escrows, preserve access to phone calls, emails, and other communication and storage applications. Under key escrow schemes, the government certified third party would keep a key to, to every device. But the government shifting tactics ultimately proved unsuccessful. The privacy, privacy and security and economic concerns continued to outweigh any potential benefits. By 1997, there was an overwhelming amount of evidence against moving ahead with the key escrow scheme. And then the second crypto war, war is going to be harder and nastier. I'm less optimistic that a strong cryptography will win in the short term. That was published uh, June 22nd um, of 2015. So Bob Robertson uh, wrote uh, a little interesting side note, and we'll talk about all these kind of things. While serving at the first line, front lines to the first crypto world, I might consider foot soldiers with PGP, RSAE, email signatures pestering my Congress scrawls who were our mindless slugs on the issue and so on. So PGP, we're going to talk, we've talked about PGP before and R, we haven't really talked about RSA. So we're going to talk about that now. So this is from the Wicca. RSA is one of the first practical public key crypto systems and is widely used for securing data transmissions. It's such a crypto system that the encryption key is public and differs from the decryption key, which is kept secret. In RSA, the asymmetric is based on the practical difficulty of factoring the product of two large prime numbers, the factory problem. RSA is made of the initial letters of the surnames of Ron Bissis, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Aldman, who first publicly described the algorithm in 1977. Clifford Cox, an English mathematician working for the UK intelligence agency GCHQ, had developed an equivalent system in 1973, but was not declassified until 1997. A user of RSA creates and then publishes a public key based on two large prime numbers and along with an auxiliary value. The prime numbers must be kept secret. Anyone can use the public key to encrypt a message but with the currently published message, if the public key is large enough, only someone with knowledge of the prime numbers could feasibly decode the message. Breaking RSA encryption is known as an RSA problem. Whether it's as hard as a factoring problem remains an open question. RSA is a relatively slow algorithm, and because of this, it's less commonly used to decrypt, to directly encrypt user data. More often, RSA passes encrypted shared keys for symmetric key cryptography, which in turn can perform bulk encryption decryption operations at much higher speed. So it's used to do kind of encrypt a key instead of actually encrypting data. Because cryptography was considered a music, I mean, basically arms, and you had to have a license to export it, uh, a lot of the, the cryptographic algorithms that people were developing couldn't be open source and published or made public for anybody to use. And one of the things that people had done to kind of challenge that is they created these RSA t-shirts. And what these t-shirts stated 
was warning this t-shirt is classified as a musician a mu- arms and may not be exported from the United States or shown to a foreign national RSA encrypted in peril and then it had an encryption signature and the uh, version of the key on here so the so this was something that people did to kind of uh, let people know that if you have this if you publish this if you left the country with this particular t-shirt you could get in trouble and it is a way to kind of push back against you know the way the government was basically going against people i mean an rsa encryption source code published on a t-shirt makes somebody a felony all of a sudden and another way was the challenge um, that we talked about on the top of that was a very deep into the 90s mind you you know RSA was created in, in the 70s, 77, if you will. Deep in the 90s was the challenge to the whole export of cryptography in the United States. And that was the case from Bernstein versus the United States. He was a student at the University of Berkeley. He wanted to publish a paper and associated source code of his uh, Snowfall encryption system. Uh, he presented it to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who, outs- who you know, coming from Wicca, who hired an outside lawyer, lawyer Cindy Conan, and obtained pro bono assistance from some other lawyers, and basically they, they challenged the whole thing. And after four years, one regulatory change, the United Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that software source code was speech protected by the First Amendment, and the government's regulations preventing its publication was unconstitutional. Regarding these regulations, EF, EF, EFF states the years before the government had placed encryption, a method of scrambling messages so you can only be understood by the intended recipient on the United States musician list alongside bombs and flamethrowers, as a weapon to be regulated for national security purposes. Companies and individuals exporting items on the munition list, including software with encryption capabilities, had to obtain prior State Department approval. The government requested an en banc review. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court ordered that the case be reheard by en banc court and withdrew the three-judge panel opinion. Um, that was uh, in 99. The government modified the regulations again, substantially loosening them, and Bernstein, now a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, challenged him again. This time, he chose to represent himself, although he had no formal legal training. And on October 15, 20, 2003, almost nine years after the Bernstein first brought the case, the judge dismissed it and asked Bernstein to come back when the government made a concrete threat. So that is something like where he can challenge again this court case and considering all that's going on right now, I would imagine that he could possibly refile and have some form of challenging of the case, if you will, about the government trying to regulate uh, cryptography if there was ever such a challenge again. Right now, people are allowed to publish encrypted code, they're allowed to publish it open source, it's not regulated any longer but there was a time where it was and it made it very difficult for private citizens to conduct business online over the internet or to in person in person because if they were to use encryption if they were to build that in their software programming to protect their data to protect their information then they had to get permission from the government more importantly if they were to transact with people outside of the united states they can get even bigger in much bigger trouble um and so these challenges started to happen, particularly, you know, in the 90s with the Clipper um, chip with the rise of the cypherpunks. So this article here talks about that. Um, talks about PGP, which is pretty good privacy, which is another blow towards the government when it came to protecting people's existing privacy, you know, protecting their email, encrypting it, if you will. So here we go. Not only that, but also on a technical standpoint. God damn it, Hannibal, stop it. On a technical standpoint, if you were encrypting your your information, if you will, you would have to use uh, encryption that, or not encrypt at all when talking to people abroad. So, for example, say here in the United States, you had permission to encrypt your information but you wanted to talk to a client in London, well, you couldn't send or use the normal encrypted channels that you normally would do so because you were, in essence, exporting that message with a program that was using encryption and you're giving it to a foreign national and that could be a bit of an issue, especially if you didn't have the licenses to do so. So it made things very, very difficult. 
But anyways, in the FBI's, NSA, and Exofax of the world versus the swollen movement of cypherpunks, civil libertarians, and millionaire ha- hackers at stake, whether privacy will exist in the 21st century. This is from Wired. It was published like, in 1994. I'm just going to kind of skim around and get to the good parts here. So, the atmosphere of uh, the science... Slingus support a fast-growing Silicon Valley company that earns its dollars by providing support to users of free software seems like a time warp to the days when hackers ran free. Though Slingus is located in a mall-like business park within earshot of the US 101, um, US's 101 freeway, it features a spacious cathedral ceiling overhanging a cluttered form of workstations, cubicles, arranging an irregular, spiritual configuration. A mattress is nestled in the rafters, in a hallway behind the reception desk is a kitchen laden with snacks, food, and drinks. Today, Saturday, only a few show up for work. The action instead is a small conference room overlooking the back of the complex, a physical meeting of groups whose members most often gather in corridors or cyberspace. Their mutual interest is an archaic field of cryptography, the study of secret codes and ciphers. The very fact that this group exists, however, is an indication that the field is about to shift into overdrive. This is a crypto with an attitude best embodied by the group's moniker, Cypherpunks. The 1 o'clock meeting doesn't really get underway until almost 3. By the time around 15 techie come civil libertarians are sitting around a table, wandering around the room, or just lying on the floor, staring at the city ceiling while listening to the conversation. Most have beards and long hair, and some other brothers gone digital. The talk ranges from reports on recent cryptography conferences to explain how empathy degrades information systems. This is an ad hoc demonstration of a new product in ATT Secure Phone, supposedly the first conversation scrambled that is simple to use as a standard issue phone. The group watches the movement as two of their numbers, including one of the country's best cryptographer minds, have trouble making the thing work. It's sort of like watching Eric Clapton struggle with a new, easy-to-play guitar. There's a discussion of random number generators, technical stuff, but everything has an underlying, if not explicitly or articulated political theme. The vital importance of getting this stuff out to the world for the public to wield. The people in this room hope for a world where individual information footprints, everything from an opinion on abortion to medical records of an actual abortion, can be traced only if the individual involved chooses to reveal them. A world where coherent messages shoot around the globe by network and microwave, but, intrudes, but intruders and feds trying to pluck them out of the vapor find out gibberish. A world where the tool of pine are transforming into instruments of privacy. This is, all, this is the only way this vision will materialize, and that by widespread use of cryptography, this is technically possible. Definitely. The obstacles are political, so the, the most powerful forces in the government are devoted to control of these tools. In short, there's a war going on between those who would liberate crypto and those who would suppress it. The seemingly innocuous bunches strewing around the conference room represent the vanguard of the pro-crypto forces. Though the background seems remote, the stakes are not. The outcome of this struggle may determine the amount of freedom our society will grant us in the 21st century. To the cyberpunks, freedom is an issue worth some risk. Arise urges one of the numbers you have nothing to lose but the bar- your barbed wire fences. And then this, this article gets into... Um, uh, Winfield Duffy um, and his cryptography, there's this code that he came up with that people utilize. Uh, he's part of this particular movement. Uh, his scheme, um, the uh, computer scientist Martin Hellman and Duffy cracked both problems. His scheme called the public key cryptography. There's a brilliant breakthrough. Every user in the system has two keys, a public key and a private key. The public key can be widely distributed without compromising security. The private key, however, is held more closely than the ATM password. You don't let nobody get at it for relatively arcane mathematical reasons. A message encoded with either key can be decoded with the other. For instance, if you want to send your secure letter, I encrypt it with the public key, which I have with your blessing, and send you a cipher text. The cipher is using your private key. Likewise, if you send a message to me, you can encrypt it with my public key, and I switch back to plain text with my private key. Uh, the principles can also be used to authenticate only one person can encrypt text with my private key, me. If you decode a message with the public key, you know beyond a doubt that it is straight from my machine to yours. The message, in essence, breaks, bears my digital signature. Uh, the public key cryptography, in the words of David Kahn, was not only the most revolutionary new concept in the field since the Renaissance, but it generated totally outside of the government domain by a private fanatic, no less. By the time Duffy and Hellman started distributing preprints of the scheme in 1975, the independent movement of photography centered in academia was growing. These new cartographers had read Khan's book, but more importantly they realized that the accelerating use of computers was going to mean a growth surge in the field. This expanded community soon had a regular conference and eventually published its own scientific journal. And then you have um, Phil Zimmerman of The Pretty Good Revolution or Pretty Good Privacy. 
He posed a question around 1977, but didn't begin seriously working on it until 1984. Uh, the more he thought about issues, the more important the project became, as he wrote in the product about documentation. His question was, why not implement a public key system on personal computers using RSA algorithms? So this is these guys were starting to think of this process, if you will. Um, by 1968, kind of skipping around here, he implemented RSA and later, later wrote a scrambling function called uh, Bassomatic, the homage to the Saturday Night Live commercial for, for a blender that liquefies dish. His piece by piece, he built the program, and in June 1991, he was ready to release. He named his software PGP for pretty good privacy. So at one time, he knew it was about using the U asking users for a fee. He swiftly became concerned that the government would one day outlaw the use of cryptography. Since Zimmerman wanted the tools of privacy descended widely before that day come, he decided to give PGP away, no strings attached. Um, he eventually uh, released a more powerful 2.0 version to ship it from New Zealand into the United States so there'll be no question about exporting forbidden tools due to some regulatory ID oddities of the RSA's patent only in the United States. Thus, PGP is potentially a patent infringer only with U.S. borders. An uncounted number of U.S. users, probably thousands, have PGP in various incarnations on DOS, Macintosh, Amagi, Atari, or Bay X VMS computers. At first, the science for the NSA actually worried Zillin. He wondered if they meant that the PGP had some sort of weakness, a trapdoor that the government had identified. But after a session with a world-class cryptographer, Zimmerman was assured that while the PGP had many inefficiencies, it offered protection at least as strong as the government standard DES. It truly was pretty good protection, so people can validate it on their own. Zimmerman allowed free distribution of the source code, something one does not enjoy with alternative encryption products, and most of the inefficiencies are addressed in 2.0. So all this is starting to come out there. People are starting to publish their own cryptography, trying to make sure that people are capable of having privacy, as this article talks about the top of the out, uh, top of the article here. So here we talk about the article talks about some of the pushback against it. Key registries, of course, require crypto users to trust self-interested third parties. A very paradox that led uh, Diffie to develop public key cryptography, but Diffie didn't intend private key to be shared. Now with colleagues, now with bosses, and certainly now with some Swifty in a suit who would flip it over to the cops at the very flash of a warrant. As Electronic Frontier founder co-founder John Perry Barlow put it, you have my encryption algorithm when you pry it from my cold dead fingers for my pri private key. But Dorothy Denon had pointed that unfettered crypto cryptography does have its trade off. The same codes to protect journalists and accountants will a bit the security of mobsters, child molesters, and terrorists. And if everyone encrypts, there certainly would be a weakening of our intelligence agencies and possibly our national security. As far as the NSA is concerned, its very mission is to establish and maintain superiority in making and breaking codes. If strong cryptography enters common usage, the task would be greatly complicated, if not rendered nearly impossible. The government itself is taking action on three fronts, and here we go. The first is the continuation of secrecy in which it guards all information concerning cryptography. Traditionally, the NSA's argument for, for this has been unimpeachable. Anything even the seemingly innocuous fact about what we're doing or even what we know gives a potential adversary advantage that we would not otherwise enjoy. Thus, for years, even the, the existence of the NSA, nicknamed no such agency by some, was denied. However, as cryptography becomes more essential for the protection of both individuals and corporations, that anything we disclose helps our enemies' argument is under attack. One of the most vigilant prodders of the, prodders of the National Security Agency in this regard is John Gilmore. Uh, the second front is the ingenious use of export controls to limit the strength of cryptography within this country. Despite the desire of the NSA, the U.S. law currently protects the way people communicate with the boundaries of the country. Practically speaking, however, only the most motivated communicators take the trouble to employ the cumbersome measures necessary to, to encrypt their own data. Routine encryption can be made easy, so Penguin said it happens automatically, but for that to happen, the mass producers of the software would have to include it as a default standard to their products, which is where we get, you know, here in the future, um, we're starting to get that with Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp, and any other future encrypted uh, messaging apps is going to be on by default. Uh, right now, Facebook Messenger doesn't have that by default, but soon I think it's going to be the case. Where the expert catch kicks in is companies like Microsoft, Apple, and WordPerfect find the unprofitable to produce two versions of their wares, one for domestic use and one for sales abroad. The path of least resistance is to adhere to the weak encryption export standards essentially denied it, designed to deny strong encryption to enemies. As a result, domestic users have less security than they would otherwise. 
The third front is a legislative initiative known as the Digital Telephony, in which the FBI is taking center stage and the lead actor in limiting not only crypto, but any system that would pose a problem for government agents implementing legal wiretaps. The deal proposed to the public is tempting. If you don't limit our high-tech communications that the government agents can easily plug in and by associating them means limit crypto, drug sellers, terrorists, and white-collar criminals will run rapid. ACLU lawyer Darnley Goldman contends, however, that by effectively dumbing down our entire communication structure, the law will put a halt to our economy's most comprehensive, most competitive, most competitive industry. So that is pretty much the the crux of the whole crypto wars, if you will. Um, the cypherpunks, you know, they want people to be able to be able to communicate privately, no matter what. The NSA and the government, on their hand, is like, well, you know, the bad guys can do it if you can do it. So the cypherpunks basically, you know, they stop the clipper chip from being installed. They push it back about against any of these kind of government weakening of uh, cartography. You had all these other companies doing the same thing from banks to computer companies to telephone companies saying, you know, the economy, the economy, the economy. And so for a while there, the crypto war kind of died down, even though the intelligence agencies and the government agencies still had significant issues with uh, the usage of photography being so publicly disseminated. Um, you can say that they went through other avenues. They either went through backdooring all sorts of software, not revealing zero-day uh, information as uh, the Snowden leaks and the recent leaks have um, have occurred uh, within the last few years. You know, the NSA is still doing its job. But now, because um, messaging apps are becoming so ubiquitous and many of them have end-to-end -end encryption baked into them by default, it will be, it's becoming more difficult for, I guess you can say, law enforcement and the NSA to do its job. Um, the article c continues on about the crypto rebels, but the key points from here um, I've gotten from it. So because of that, what you, you had was this lull, if you will. Once the clipper chip sunk and once um, the Bernstein court case went through, and um, the challenge, if you will, and the, you saw the uh, deregulation, if you can say it as, as such, of cryptography and all these different uh, PGP, the PGP protocol, these different cryptogra cryptography protocols being disseminated out there, uh, different companies doing different things with it, particularly the banking industry. Um, you saw, you know, stuff being disseminated, but it wasn't quite ubiquitous because it, one, it's a bit cumbersome. Um, there wasn't enough, you can say, UI or user-friendly applications, particularly with PGP, even though a lot of email services allow you to use PGP, uh, some of them have it even baked in. It, you know, using cryptography is still kind of cumbersome for an everyday user, even someone who has um, some tech savvy is still cumbersome. So having it baked in into the protocol, if you will, um, in the background where you don't really have to do much is what messaging apps do. And by making it that much of an ease of usage, you're seeing more and more people using it. Even getting to there really didn't begin to happen until after the Snowden leaks. Because as much as people advocated for privacy, 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 most people weren't doing it as a product or a company or going through it because it just really didn't make much economic sense. Uh, there wasn't really a clamoring or a demand for it. It wasn't until those leaks began to happen with the WikiLeaks, the Snowden leaks, the the, the Chelsea Manning leaks, all these leaks started to happen that people began to realize what a lot of people have been saying for decades about the, the pervasive government monitoring of just everything. And so a lot of people began to question what type of uh, uh, programs they were using, what type of computers they were using, what type of hardware they were using. They were beginning to question and poke and prod and, and question everything and seeking other avenues to protect themselves. Another second thing that I think has contributed to the rise of the usage of privacy is just the over-commercialization of the internet in and of itself. Uh, with, you know, first began with like pop-up browse, you know, pop-ups that began to happen, like all that made the internet very tedious to navigate um, in the early 90s. And then you, you had people that were countering up and stopping the pop-up browsers until eventually it became a regulation where you couldn't do that any longer. And then you have the embedded advertisements. You have the trackers, right, whatever browser you use. Uh, ad blockers to prevent, you know, malware, um, the use of all your data being sold here and there. If you use Gmail and you, you talk about, you know, uh, 
rainbows and unicorns, all of a sudden you start seeing rainbow t-shirts and unicorn figurines being in your, you know, embedded email sidebar things. And even if you didn't talk about it in the email, maybe you talked about it on Facebook and then you go um, to a different website and then a different website. And by the third website, you see um, unicorns and t-shirts and you're wondering, well, how the hell did that even happen? Um, so you start, people are starting to question the very nature of how the internet is structured, um, all the information that is being gathered and disseminated about people and their privacy in general. And it's because of that, you're starting to see these baked in privacy things. You're starting to see people making the, the cypherpunk dream of everything being encrypted, um, and not being able to be followed or tracked or their information being disseminated in such a way where it becomes very difficult for, for that to happen. So here's a timeline from a daily dot called A Complete Guide to the New Crypto War. This came out April 26, 2016 by Eric Geller. Encryption is finally a mainstay. Government officials and technologists have debated since the early 90s whether to limit the strength of encryption to help. It really began really way before that, but the encryption to help law enforcement and intelligence communities monitor suspect, suspects' communications. By early 2016, this was a mostly esoteric fight regulated to academic conferences, security agencies, CSIS, and the back room of Capitol Hill. Everything changed in mid-February when Barack Obama's Justice Department investigated the terrorists who carried out the San Bernardino, California shooting and asked a federal judge to force Apple to help the FBI to unlock one attacker's iPhones. What followed was an unexpected, rancorous, and unprecedentedly public fight over how far the government should go to pierce and degrade commercial security technology in a quest to protect Americans from terrorism. But the San Bernardino iPhone dispute was, was only the most visible sign that the decades-old encryption war was not yet over. The second phase of this war had already been raging for years. The rise of the digital savvy lone wolf terrorists combined with Silicon Valley's increased adoption of unbreakable encryption in the aftermath of 2013 Edward Snowden's intelligent leaks had merely heightened existence and unavoidable tension between technology industry and government investigators. I think one of the things that is missing really is the commercialization of everything on the internet because as much as people talk about the Snowden leaks and all these government leaks that have happened since then and even before Snowden, people still, even though they may dislike their government, they, they still trust their government. They're going to still in essence, comply or not think much of it because they're going to think on an individual basis that the government is not going to come after them because they are a good person or they have nothing to hide, if you will, or they've done nothing wrong. And so for the most part, they're not too deeply concerned by what um, the government does, the, the privacy thing. Um, and for some part, for some, they actually agree with what the government's doing because they're like, you know, you have to get those tariffs. Why... Why are you encrypting everything that shouldn't be done? You know, the government law enforcement should have every tool available to do what they need to do, um, regardless of, you know, the privacy issues. So you have that going on. I think really what it is is the combination of what the government is doing and, you know, the Facebook and Google and the such the over-commercialization and all these different hacks of all these different email, uh, email leaks to Ashley Madison's. There seems to be a breach everywhere, particularly with credit cards and you have these ransomware things going on. Um, you have hospitals and medical records being disseminated, all this going on and happening. I think that really has um, not only agitated the population um, and aggravated a lot of people, but it's, they're beginning to really question the nature of how data flows on the internet and how much data do they have to give out because now it, it is individually affecting them. Um, they, they're individually, individually being affected um, by these more these commercial um, breaches in the um, breach of trust of the government because now it's affecting their pocketbook. Um, beforehand, the, the Snowden things and the, the NSA and all of this government um, into everything, backdoor and everything, keeping zero days, all these uh, tools that have um, been leaked by... Um, what was the group? Uh, the shadow brokers and the Vault 7 stuff that we, we leaks has been um, leaking. None of that really affected people on an individual basis. But hacking Yahoo or uh, what was the recent one? Um, 
one of the fast food places, uh, you know, when you swipe the card, that data breach happened with them. So that that is what's really concerning to people if you will think of anything of nothing else is that I think is really coloring this agitation about having privacy and encrypting everything. So security agencies accustomed to being open and safely balk at the notion advanced by the American tech giants like Apple and their allies and the cryptography of private community community. The encryption was sacrosanct. City, state, and federal law enforcement officials began pushing Congress to require the tech companies only use encryption they could break in case of investigators need to serve them with warrants for user data. Uh, computer science professors and cryptographers and digital rights activists who were beating back similar demands in the 99, 1990s experienced deja vu. The serious vice, which we call the crypto wars, had only been the first round of a prolonged conflict. Now it was settled for the crypto wars round two. But where and when did this new phase begin? Could knowing the exact moment may be impossible, but the, the timeline below provides a readily comprehensive overview of the different fights that constitute the new crypto war, from the early months of September 11, 2001, and the terrorist attack to the present day. So January 9, 2003, the, the Justice Department drafts the Domestic Security Enhancement Act of 2003, aka Patriot Act II. As U.S. Congress debated the U.S. Patriot Act after September 11, 2001, the terrorist attacks supporters of strong encryption worried that lawmakers would use the climate of fear and anxiety to slip provision targeting encryption. That didn't happen. The Patriot Act didn't address the subject at all, but nearly two years after it took effect, President George W. Bush Justice Department declared excessor bill, the Domestic Security Enhancement Act of 2003, that did address encryption in a major way. A draft of the bill, first obtained by the Center for Public Integrity include a provision adding a minimum of five years to the sentence of any convicted felon who used encryption to conceal, incriminate communication, or information related to the crime. The bill, which critics dubbed Patriot Act II, never became law, but it was the government's first foray into the encryption regulation in the modern era, and like the eventual Apple FBI fight over the San Bernardino iPhone, it took place in the climate of intense terrorism and anxiety. August 2007, security researchers exposed a backdoor in the NSA backed encryption protocol. In March 2007, the National Institute of Standards and Technology published a document describing four methods of generating pseudo-random numbers, random numbers generated in the basis of cryptography. Encryption protects people's data by scrambling it according to this random process, making it impossible to predict how the scrambling is occurring and how to unscramble it. Five months later, cryptographers Dan Schumo and Niels Ferguson delivered a talk at a security conference outlining weaknesses in one of the NS NIST four methods known as the dual elliptic curve deterministic random bit generator, or dual E uh, dirge. Man, they, whew, they really need to get better acronyms. They were the first people to widely publicize the idea that the dual EC might obtain a backdoor. Two members of the standard writing body had previously written a little known patent detailing the possibility of such a vulnerability. Reviewing the presentation, the, the eminent security researcher Bruce Schoener wrote that the dual EC contained the weakness that can only be described as a back door. And essentially, the dual EC was created in such a way that there was a way to predict the supposedly random number generation process. Anyone could do this, could un unscramble any data encrypted with a dual EC. In September 2013, the New York Times reported that the NSA had aggressively pushed NIST and the International Organization for Standardization to adopt dual EC as a cryptography cryptographic standard. Eventually, read a document provided to the Times by a former intelligence contractor, Edward Snowden, that the NASA became, the NSA became the sole editor of the standard. In 2013, it, it emerged that the NSA had paid leading security firm RSA $10 million to add dual EC to one of its products. At the time, the RSA decision had encouraged many others in the industry to adopt the code. The RSA's chief technologist later told Reuters that the company could have been more skeptical of the NSA's intentions. In April 2014, NIST formally withdrew its recommendations of dual EC, and NIST's unwitting assistance in leaking global security security seriously damaged its reputation as a reliable government partner for security industry. So they ba they ba basically pushed a back door. And it's becoming more and more apparent with the Vault 7 leaks, the Shadow Broker leaks, and um, the Snowden leaks, that there's a lot of this backdoor pushing, if you will, by the government to weaken certain aspects of um, computer technology, whether it be hardware chips, whether it be software protocol. Um, there was a story breaking out now. Um, it's just kind of breaking out with a, a paper published about 
uh, Hewitt Packard's um, audio device that there's there's a hidden key logger within their audio device that can log in your keystrokes, um, and it's just running rapid as people are examining the paper and looking at um, the audio device and, and confirming it for themselves or disproving it or going through that process, if you, if you will. And it's being found more and more. There's been some issues with certain chips um, from Intel to um, a few other different types of chips where people are questioning why this is here on a, a motherboard or what it does it actually really do as people are starting to break down hardware and finding that there's certain little oddities or certain things that you would consider to be there or flaws that were easily fixed. So January 2008, FBI begins briefing lawmakers about the encryption threat. The first instance of an FBI using is now famous for encryption shot and criminals' communication going dark appears to have been in early 2008. In January, then FBI Director Robert Mueller testified for, before both House of Cong before the before both houses of Congress, including a gold dark page in his briefing book, and according to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which obtained the documents through the Freedom of Information Act. Senior FBI officials continue to meet with key lawmakers and community staff to discuss going dark. Carrie Hines, the bureau's executive assistant director for science and technology, told members of Congress that the ability of the FBI to collect intelligence and conduct investigations through the use of technology is shrinking every day. Included in the EFA's FOIA documentation was a page from the FBI's internal WICA describing problems with lawful intercept capabilities, which read, In the face of more diverse and complex communication services and technologies, including the rapid growth in diverse protocols, proprietary compression techniques, encryption, and other technology factors, Law enforcement is now faced with several especially daunting law enforcement intercept challenges. Uh, in 2011, February 2011, the FBI's top lawyer brings going dark to the public's attention. Valley Caproni, the FBI's general counsel, provided the first lengthy explanation of going dark problem at the House Judiciary Committee subcommittee hearing in February 2011. At the time, Caproni downplayed the perceived threat of encryption itself, addressing the going dark problem does not require fundamental changes in encryption technology, he told lawmakers. We understand that there are situations in which encryption will require law enforcement to develop individualized solutions. The attitude was not lost. May 4th of 2012, the FBI pushes legislation to ensure a wiretap friendly. While Capri publicly promised the FBI was to seek fundamental changes in encryption technology, her office prep draft legislation would force email providers, VOP service operators, IM clients, and social networks to modify their services to ensure that they were wiretap friendly. The bill was modifying the Communication Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALL, a 1994 U.S. law that requires phone and internet providers to design their equipment to allow for law enforcement wiretaps. The FBI has been working on the draft legislation for years, but the middle of 2012 was ready for prime time. Yet while the Justice Department signed up on the bill, the Obama White House declined to push it on the Hill. In the end, the legislation was never introduced. 2013, June, the second Snowden document exposed a massive internet surveillance program. For years, the NSA and the FBI directly accessed U.S. technology company servers to scoop up their users' data without a warrant, but relying on a program called PRISM. The agency could circumvent warrant requirements and avoid alerting the companies altogether. The Silicon Valley exploded with outrage in response to PRISM's revelations, which came from the former NSA contractor Edward Snowden's trove of documents. A few months later, more Snowden files revealed that the NSA has penetrated the links between data centers owned by Google and Yahoo around the world. PRISM and data center leaks accelerated a trend towards strong encryption that would eventually create new problems for law enforcement. In March 2014, partly in response to the leaks, Google announced it would encrypt all Gmail data that flowed between its data centers, and Yahoo followed suit a few weeks later. The problem is that Yahoo also built a backdoor within its email service that allowed for the hackers to come in and do that major dump. Uh, September 5th, 2013, Snowden's documents exposed in the NSA's campaign to break encryption. The same Snowden source New York Times story that confirmed the NSA's involvement in dual EC also exposed a vast anti-encryption operation called Bull Run. Having lost the public battle in the 1990s to insert its own backdoor in all encryption, the NSA set out to accomplish the same goal by stealth. The Bull Run program involved custom-built, super-fast computers to break codes in partnership with U.S. and foreign technology firms to build entry points into the products. In some cases, the companies they were coerced by the government into handing over their master encryption keys or building a backdoor. This would happen with the um, the LaVette um, email service provider. That's why they shut down. 
and the agency uses influence as the world's most experienced code maker to covertly introduce weaknesses into the encryption standards, followed by hardware and software developers around the world. The Times set off a firestorm, and NIST declared that they would not deliver a weaken, weaken a cryptographic standard, and explained that it was legally required to consult with NSA on its cryptographic work. Security researchers and John Hopkins professor Matthew Green told the Times that a number of people at NIST feel betrayed by their colleagues at the NSA. September 2014, Apple and Google add a full disk encryption to their mobile operating systems. Apple fighters shot across the bow of police everywhere when it announced on September 17, 2014, that iOS, iOS 8 just unveiled update its mobile operating system, including encryption designs to prevent the company from decrypting its users' data. The iOS new full dis- disk encryption shut out Apple by, trying, by tying the security features on the iOS device to a user's passcode. Because only users knew their passcode, no one could reverse the d- device's encryption. Uh, Google's Android operating system already offered full disk encryption as an option, but the company announced two days after Apple unveiled, I- unveiled the iOS 8 that it would soon become a default feature. It later backed away from the stance, unlike Apple, Google does not manufacture Android phones, but the company I do worry the performance issues with show, with, associated with the full disk encryption, but we'll return to it in, in late 2015. In January 12, 2015, UK Prime Minister proposed banning end-to-end encryption apps. Without promoting his government's planned surveillance bill, the UK Prime Minister David Cameron argued that messaging services without decryption cap- capabilities should be banned. In our country, we do not allow means of communication between people which we cannot read, Cameron asked. If Cameron proposed law, Facebook, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, Apple, iMessage, and Telegram, among other popular services, would have to close. These apps used end-to-end encryption that even their creators cannot pierce. Five days before Cameron's speech, two terrorists killed 11 people and 11 others in an attack on a French uh, satirical newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. It was the first of several terrorist attacks over the next few years that officials would seize upon to push for expanded government surveillance. October 10, 2015, the Obama administration said it won't seek encryption backdoor legislation. October 20, 2015, Apple says it shouldn't be forced to unlock a New York drug suspect's iPhone. In a little notice filing in the Manhattan District Court that presaged the eruption of a global news event, Apple strongly objected to the government's request for an order requiring the company to help police unlock a criminal's iPhone. Citing the inability of the 17 17- 89 law called the Alt Ritz Act and the precedent that complying with the order was set for other types of demands, Apple indicated it would fight the order and the magistrate judge issued it. October, two, October 27, 2015, the White House petitioned for Obama to reject backdoor doors past 100,000 signature mark. November 4, 2015, the British government introduced investigatory power bill. While Americans debate encryption policy with the government, the United Kingdom's ruling Conservative Party push, pursued a controversial expansion of the counterterrorism powers that left the door open for British backdoor mandates. The investigatory powers bill immediately earned scorn from Apple and other tech, no- tech companies for its vague language concerning encryption. Several parliamentary communities also recommended that the House office clarify what it expected from tech firms. In November 13, 2015, terrorists killed 100 people, 130 people in Paris. Coordinated suicide bombings and shootings at a stadium, a restaurant, and theater in Paris and in nearby sub- suburbs sent France into a national state of emergency. While the government issued a, cur- a curfew for the first time since World War II, as an Islamic state claimed responsibility for the deadly impact in the European Union since the 2004 mid Madrid train bombings. Western nations braced for a new wave, new wave of ISIS inspired extremism at home. Almost immediately, American officials began proposing new surveillance powers, including encryption backdoors, to help catch extremists in the United States before they struck. Former intelligence agency heads and a leader of the House Homeland Security Committee argued that unbreakable encryption increases the likelihood of a successful attack. In the months that followed, encryption panics sometimes obscure the facts. Many, outlet, many outlets ran with the story about an Islamic State encryption message app called Arroali that fed the narrative advanced by Comey and other opponents of unbe- unbreakable encryption. But the Daily Dot reported the app was staked. The Android application file was ported to send and receive encrypted messages did no such thing. Uh, November 17, 2015, Congress starts looking at encryption. The first promise by a committee chairman to examine encryption came four days after the Paris attack. Uh, both Richard Burr, the North Carolina Republican who served in the Senate Intelligence Committee, and John McCain, the Arizona Republican, who headed the Senate Armed Service Committee, posed to study the issue with McCain calling the ability of companies to offer unbreakable encryption unacceptable. Uh, December 2nd, 2015, the San Bernardino shooting. The world was still reeling from a deadly terrorist attack on the EU. 
country in the decade when two ISIS-inspired jihadists shot and killed 14 people at San Bernardino, Cal- San Bernardino California Health Center in the deadliest terror attack on U.S. soil since September 11, 2001. December 9, 2015, Senate Intelligence Community leaders announced plans for a black backdoor bill. A few hours before Comey first public- publicly mentioned Bar Rooks now infamous iPhone, Senator Dianne Feinstein, the top Democrat of the Senate Intelligence Committee, announced that she and Barr, the committee's chairman, were working on a bill to guarantee investigators' ability to lead against encrypted data. Uh, December 17, 2015, firewall maker reveals likely backdoor in its code. Almost two years after NIST told companies to stop using the dual EC random number generator and encryption, uh, Juniper Networks announced the discovery of unauthorized code in several versions of its ScreenOS software, which ran on its net screen firewalls. A few days later, security researchers revealed that the code was based on dual EC. The NIST uh, pseudorandom number, number generator that the NSA had secretly sabotaged with the back door. In 2013, Juniper had defended its decision to continue using dual EC despite the revelation of its weakness by saying that it had paired dual EC in its firewall software with a much stronger number generator. But the researchers discovered that Juniper had actually added dual EC to its code more than a year after its flaws were publicly revealed. Jupiter uh, removed dual C and upgraded screen OS security in January, but the fallout from the incident provided a case study in dangers of encryption vulnerabilities. Uh, the House Oversight Committee began investigating whether any federal agency had used Juniper firewalls, raising the possibility that with its encryption backdoor, the NSA had exposed the federal government to hackers. December 23, 2015, China said it modeled its new encryption policy on U.S. law. The Chinese China's recent, recently passed counterterrorism law, which included vague language that would morph into a backdoor mandate, earned its significant criticism, but Beijing says it only followed the lead of the United States. The Chinese government moved to further consolidate its control over tech companies in a way reflected the global nature of encryption and technology policy making, and the possibility that the future U.S. government actions to undermine encryption would spread overseas, finding especially receptive audience in repressive regimes. Okay, uh, December 27th, 2015, lawmakers unveiled a bipartisan proposal for an encryption commission. January 4th, 2016, the Netherlands became the first country to formally reject backdoors. The government believes that it's currently not desirable to 